Thank you, Scott. Great singing this morning. Good to uh, see you here. This is a good number assembled here in person. And uh, that number just seems to be gradually rising and increasing, and we're glad for that. It's a, it's a slow process. We've been kind of rebuilding after this uh, virus and pandemic and still have a ways to go. We appreciate your understanding and your cooperation. Appreciate so much our elders in leading us through this uh, difficult time over the last year. It's been a challenge in many ways, but it's great to be together here today and on this beautiful Lord's Day. I heard about a old BC comic strip, uh, maybe some of you read that from time to time, where these two Stone Age characters are uh, digging a huge hole. And they're busily digging and digging, and pretty soon they're down deep into the hole. All you can see is their voices coming out, and one of them says, hey, wait a minute. How are we going to get out of here? And the other one says, I suggest by the same means that we got in here, mass stupidity. <laughs> I'm afraid, folks, when it comes to our homes and our families, here in the United States of America today, there is more than ever a need to come back to common sense biblical principles or foundational principles from the Word of God. Because the farther we get away from them, the more it closely resembles mass stupidity. And so we're looking again at a series of lessons on godly homes empowering your home to be all that God intended. And what I would like us to do is to continue now looking at some foundational principles, some passages from the Word of God, and I'm going to ask us to just rid our minds of any preconceptions, anything that we may have picked up from the culture. Those who are viewing online, if you will just kindly lay aside all politically correct notions for a few moments, and go with me back to some basic passages from the Word of God. Let's, let's listen to what God says about godly homes. After all, he is the inventor of the home. He invented marriage. And so we're looking at some foundations upon which we can build that are truly from God himself. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we've seen that God said, let us make man in our image. And we talked last week briefly about what that means, and that there's something about man that resembles God, and it's not physical appearance he's talking about. Man has a soul. He is like God, and God has paid him a high compliment not only in his creation, but in his continued and compassionate care. And the Bible says, let them, that is man, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And at the end of the lesson last week, we looked at the gay lesbian agenda in this country, and it has been gaining steam now for quite some time in an attempt to normalize, naturalize certain ways of life that are foreign to God's word. Certain behavior that God sees as foreign and is not included in God's fundamental plan for the family. Well, why would we care about that? Why stress that? Because we care about living a life that is pleasing to God and encouraging everyone around us to see the beauty in that, the happiness in that, the fulfillment in that. It isn't that we don't love People, as a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that it takes real love to point out the things that God points out to us here. He doesn't say these things to make people miserable. He says them because he loves us 
and he wants us to be happy and content and fulfilled. As we saw last week, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly, John 10 and verse 10. So let's go to another, you might call it foundational passage. This is one again with which we should be very familiar. I think I would mark this in my Bible, make sure I can turn to this one quickly. Notice what he says. And Jehovah God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. The word meet there, M-E-E-T, can also be translated suitable or appropriate. All right. If something is meet for the occasion, that means that it's appropriate on that particular occasion. And God is saying that I'm going to create a helper that is suitable, that is appropriate for the man. Why? Because it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, he doesn't stop and explain here why it is not good. He just says, as a, as a general rule, it's not good. We get additional insight into that, looking at other passages in the scriptures, even into the New Testament, where the Apostle Paul will address that theme again. He'll come back to that and explain why it's not good, generally speaking. Although there are some exceptions to that, Paul said he was able, by the grace of God, to live the single life, to be an effective minister of uh, Christ, unmarried. But as a general rule, that's not an ideal situation. Paul recognized that, and he says not everyone has that gift. It takes a real gift to be able to do that. God recognized that. He said, I'm going to make and help meet for him, suitable for him. And Jehovah God, verse 21, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Now notice here is uh, the first case of medical uh, anesthesia performed by God himself. He put him to sleep. And what did he do? He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which Jehovah God had taken from the man made he a woman. He took a rib from that man, and of that rib he made a woman. Do you believe that? I do. I believe that. Have you ever seen anything like that happen? No, I haven't. Can you verify scientifically that that occurred? No, I can't. I can't conduct an experiment in the laboratory and show how we can take a rib and, and convert that into an actual person or female. No, I can't do that. But do you know why we know that that happened? Because the Bible says so. The Bible says that God did that. And he did that. Our God, who is big enough to create this universe and all that we see around us in six days, is certainly capable of taking a rib from the man and creating the first woman. And he presents her. He brings her unto the man. Can you imagine the man's reaction? We're not told what the reaction was. But I'm sure that he was very, very pleased. After all, he had looked around and seen in the animal kingdom all around him the concept of male and female. There were always seemed to be a mate for every animal out there. And he, he had to notice that he was deficient in some way. He was lacking. God certainly noticed that. And God didn't permit that to continue. Now, I want us to see right here that there is a cooperation, a complementary relationship between male and female human beings. You say, well, why are you reminding us of that? Because it's necessary. Isn't it? Do we not live in a culture which the media of which is thriving upon promoting division and competition between male and female? Isn't that the, the world we're living in? 
You try listening to, to the four or five minutes of hourly news on the radio sometime and see if you can get through one broadcast, one, without taking advantage of that opportunity to, to create competition and strife between male and female people. I'm telling us this morning from the Word of God that men and women are not in competition in the sight of God. They are complementary. They support one another. They are intended from the beginning to support one another, to be there for each other. Young ladies, if you are living your life based on an aspiration to somehow competitively be superior to all of the boys that you know. You are, in the words of Solomon, striving after the wind. That is not your purpose or function in life. That will not make you happy. And young men, if you're trying to compete against the young ladies and say, well, I can do that better than any girl can do it, you're barking up the wrong tree. The Bible says that there is a normal and natural role for both man and woman, that they stand together, as has been so poetically or figuratively pointed out at many weddings, God did not take the woman from the head of man to be his ruler, didn't take her from his foot to be his slave, but took the woman from his side to be at his side, to be there as an help meet for him. And this man recognized that. And he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Note the significance in that. Jesus is going to come back to that point later. There is a physical overlap between men and women. This is now bone of my bones. Flesh of my flesh, Adam recognized. How do you feel when you invest your own blood, sweat, and tears into something? Isn't that a way of saying that you are invested, that you care, that it is a part of who you are? They go together. Jesus, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, is said to have shed his life's blood to purchase the Lord's church. Think of that. The church, the bride of Christ now, was purchased literally by the blood of Jesus Christ. Who would you give your life's blood for? For what would you shed your own life's blood? Whatever it is, it becomes a part of who you are. It's important to you. And that's what the man is saying here. This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Can't you see the beautiful symmetry between man and woman? in these verses. Friends, may we forever, once and for all, shed this notion that the, the genders are somehow in a deadly competition, that we must be showing each other up at every turn. That will prevent a fulfilled and happy, godly home life because it's not according to God's plan. Going further into Genesis 2, verses 18 through 24, he concludes with this statement, which we will revisit shortly from our Lord. Here the Bible says, therefore. That's a word of conclusion, a word that suggests that what I'm about to say follows from the premises that have gone before. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave, a word meaning cling to in a strong, inseparable way, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one what? Flesh. They shall be one flesh. 
as it was in the beginning, so it is now. She came from the very flesh and blood and bone and marrow and joints of this man, and they shall be one again. There is something physical in this relationship. Our Lord will come back to that in, in a later passage, but let's note that right now as a foundational fact with regard to men and women. Now, let's fast forward several thousand years. Man has been created. Woman has been created. They have been side by side as husband and wife joined by God down through the various generations. Jesus comes. And he is asked a question about marriage and divorce. And you remember how the Pharisees were always trying to trip him up. And the question was, in essence, can a, is it right for a man to put away his wife for any cause? And that, that had be become essentially the practice under the old law. A man could divorce his wife for trivial causes. They had it so loosely interpreted the law of God. They had to know that wasn't right. And so they take advantage of this opportunity to try to tempt or test our Lord. Is that, is that the way it is? Notice the answer in verse 4 of Matthew 19. He answered and said, Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Now stop and think about all the marriages that you have known in your lifetime that have been torn apart by a failure to do that. Young people, if you are planning to get married, you must be prepared to leave your father and your mother. And parents, when our children get married, we must step back and let them be married. Many homes, many marriages have been literally destroyed by the improper interference and the constant presence of the parents who seem to think it was their role to sort of look over the shoulders of their children and make sure now everything is going the way they want it to in this marriage. And the husband can't make any decision without double checking with his parents. You know what that will do to a marriage? It'll destroy a marriage. If you are mature enough to step out and get married, young person, you are mature enough to leave mama and daddy. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to have no further contact with him. That's not what he's saying. In fact, he'll continue teaching with regard to roles and relationships, obligations toward parents, long into our latter years. And even on the cross, our Lord had something to say about that. But he's stating a clear principle here of independent families. You're starting your own family. You're getting married. And shall leave mother and father and shall cleave, he says, to his wife. One of the reasons why so many marriages don't last very long is we've forgotten what it means to cleave. It means we're going to stick like glue. We are going to stick together. If you're going to attack my wife, you better, be, you better know that you're attacking me. And I know that my wife has my back as well. We stick together. If she needs something, I need to be there to try to provide for that need and vice versa. It isn't going to be all about me anymore. I remember a, an older member of the church giving me a piece of advice years ago with regard to marriage. You know, we talk about how it's a 50-50 proposition. He said, Bob, that's really a misnomer. It is a 100%, 100% proposition. In other words, you're going to have to give 100% of yourself to make this marriage work, and your spouse is going to have to do that too. It's 100%, 100%.
cleaving together. You are deciding that from this moment on, we're a family. We're together. Now, I know that there are situations, in particularly in modern culture, where the breadwinner has to go off to some location or maybe serve in the military and be away for a long period of time. I've known of sailors that were on a submarine for six months away from their family, away from their wife, their young wife. I realize there are times where it is unavoidable, but I'll tell you what, folks, it needs to be avoided. If at all possible, that kind of situation needs to be strenuously avoided. We need to cleave together. Our activities should be planned to involve and include both of us. Now, there are th some things that men do and that women do that are not appropriate for the other to participate. I get that. But as a way of life and moving forward, our focus needs to be drawing us together, not apart. Ladies, in a marriage, if you are the wife in a marital situation, you find yourself pursuing interests with, quote, the girls, or you are pursuing some hobby that is taking you in a direction different from your husband. Be careful about that. I've known of a number of otherwise fine, very wonderful, charming ladies who had gotten married and got so involved in the girls at the office or some of the guys at the office, the first thing you know, their husband wasn't hardly in their daily schedule at all. Well, what's going to happen? Husbands who are so busy pursuing their hobbies or their recreation or whatever it may be that there is very precious little time left for their wife in their schedule, that's a recipe for disaster. Jesus says, cleave to each other. I don't have a better friend on this earth than my wife. There isn't anybody that I would rather spend time with than my wife. And that's the way we need to be working toward our marriages. Growing together and not growing apart. And then he says, they shall become one flesh. There is a physical aspect to marriage that Jesus recognizes and approves of. You know where we get into trouble with regard to the um, reality of that statement in the marriage bond? It's when we try to deny it. We have religious organizations today actively teaching that it is somehow more pious, more spiritual, more religious to abstain from marital relations. That's not the way the Bible reads. I, I've checked. I can't find that anywhere in the Bible. There is nothing wrong with a good, healthy, physical, marital relationship. As a matter of fact, that is God's plan for married men and women. Do not neglect that in your marriage. Don't think, well, we're busy right now, but we'll get around to developing that down the line. No, that is a central part of the relationship. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, ordered that the wife and the husband render to each other their due, and the King James has the word their due benevolence. The idea is that failure to provide for the physical attraction and needs of our marital partners is itself a form of robbery. It's a form of taking or stealing. Your spouse is entitled to your physical body. It is not your body alone. It is your spouse's. They shall become one flesh. 
Here again, the culture, oh, today we hear people talking like, oh, that, you're, nobody's going to tell me what to do with my body. Is that the way the Bible reads? Whose body is it anyway? Now, ultimately, the body in a marital relationship belongs to the spouse and belongs to God. Paul would say to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and again in chapter 6, that it is the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And he says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and is not your own. So the, all, all this talk about my own body is really a misnomer. It's no longer my own. When I get married, that body belongs to my wife. And hers to me. And we together belong to God. They shall become one flesh. Verse 6, so that they are no more two, but one flesh. I think it is uh, very telling that our forefathers who laid out our legal system, which, which they inherited in various respects from those gone before them, recognized this principle. Do you know that when you purchase a house and it's titled as tenants by the entirety, that is as husband and wife, that is a separate unified entity? It's no longer owned individually by him or her. You know that if husband gets, a, gets into a, a debt situation, gets a judgment entered against him, do you know that that judgment creditor cannot go after that marital property? Why? Because he does not own it individually anymore. It's owned by this new entity called husband and wife. You see, we used to understand these things. Jesus is saying, well, that, that's, that's obvious. Haven't you read? They shall be one flesh. There are no more two, but one. And then this. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Oh, if we could just get that one fundamental foundational fact. How it would transform American culture today. I have seen children crying as they were held by their grandparents out in the hallway of the courthouse and their parents were in there arguing about custody and divorce and visitation and all of the other man-made attempts to patch together what should never have happened in the first place. Because God says, what God hath joined together now, listen, let not man put asunder. If somebody comes to you, a young person, marriage age, and maybe they're having a little trouble in marriage, and they say, what should I do? Do not tell them to separate. Don't say, like many in the world would say, well, I think you just need to have your own space for a while and you need to separate and go your separate ways. Go ahead and separate. Now, I may be wrong, folks, but the way I read that verse it's, is that what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That's what it says. I think that's what it means. The last thing I want to do is put asunder or divide a husband and a wife that God has joined together. Are you on the same page with God this morning? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Put him on in baptism, made him the, the Lord of your life? All these things that we're talking about are very fundamental. But we cannot appreciate what God has for us until we humble ourselves to God, become a member of his body, the church. Repenting of our sins, confessing our faith, being baptized into Christ, rising from that watery grave, having our sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb, to live a faithful life dedicated to him. God gives us the way. He gives us the roadmap, and he gives us the foundational principles to do that. 
Are you ready to set forth on that journey here this morning? Do you need to step out in obedience to the gospel of Christ? If so, we stand ready to assist you even today. Would you come while together we stand and sing?